Welcome to Central Church Online. If this is your first time with us, please text us using the info at the bottom of the screen. We'd love to get to know you better. Here at Central, we have five points of connection. Attend regularly, serve purposefully, give generously, invite boldly, and connect relationally. And if you'd like to give generously, see the three options shown at the bottom of the screen. Enjoy the service. All right, you know how this goes. You've got a Bible, grab it, open it, turn it on. Follow along on screen in your outline, or if you have it, use the Central Church app. If you don't have that, I would encourage you to go to um, your app store or Google Play and download that. You can get announcements. You can communicate through that thing. It's really cool to have. Um, but you can turn to Matthew 16. So we're going to start today. Um, we're going to jump around a few places, but we're going to start in Matthew 16. Um, Matthew 16, if you've been around for any amount of time at Central, I've, I, I use this passage a lot. It's one of my most favorite passages um, in the entire Bible um, because Jesus says some stuff that, honestly, it's why we're here. Um, and so we'll talk about that in a minute. But this is week number four of our series called Signs of the Times. This is the last week. Um, I've told you that we could spend multiple, multiple, multiple weeks and totally exhaust this subject. Um, but by the end, like we're still not going to agree on all of it. There's still going to be some, some things to debate. There's still going to be some stuff that's like completely over our heads. There's going to be stuff that I'm going to be honest with you and I'm going to tell you I don't understand. Like I don't, I don't know what that really means. And, and so we could spend tons of time on it. But really what I wanted to do was just emphasize the fact that as the church, it's super important for us to understand that Jesus is coming back. You can have all your, your theories of when and how and, and all of those different things, but the, the thing you have to land on that we have to agree upon is that Jesus is coming back. And so the past three weeks, just like today, we're, we've been looking at what the Bible says about the end times. Now, today might feel a little bit different. And as I'm going through this, and as I talk about this, you might think, well, this is an end times message, but it'll make sense as we go through it. All right, I'm going to start off today like this. I'm going to start off with a confession, because I know you love it when I confess things, and I love doing it, because this honestly is my therapy time. Um, but this is like no surprise, little to no surprise for most of you. Here it is. I love food. Anybody else? As a matter of fact, like, I'm a foodie, but I'm a bit of a food snob. Anyone else there in that? Now, here's the thing. I love going to certain places that have great food over and over and over again. Like if I were to ask you today, my favorite place in Carroll is where? You would say, <laughs> you my people, I love you. Bornero's, if you ain't never been there, man, you got to go. It is the greatest place in the world. Like the meat there, the steaks, phenomenal. Lunchtime, like I'm a little bit, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm encouraged, discouraged. But years ago, when they first started doing lunch, you went in and they had one thing. And you didn't like it, too bad. That's what you ate. And I guarantee you were going to like it. But they had one thing. And if you didn't want that, it's like, no soup for you. Like, that's, that's what it was. Um, now, I went in the other day. On Thursday, he had four options. And on Friday, he had three options. And I'm just like, Tommy, I don't know how I feel about this, man, because I just can't make up my mind. And he'll say, why don't you get all three? Okay, cool. So anyway, I love that place. Now, if I had a choice to go anywhere to eat, like if money was no object, if distance was no object, um, maybe you have a restaurant like this that, that you really like and, and you're thinking that. My most favorite place to eat is a place called Fogo de Cho. I don't know if you've ever been to this place or one of these. It is phenomenal. These, these people, they're like all dressed up in like tuxedos and they come out and they bring you meat on a skewer endless meat like it doesn't stop until like you start out you got a card on one side it's red on the other side it's green when it's green they just keep bringing you meat I think it says feed me or something like that on the front the back side the red side I have no idea what it says because by the time I flip it to red I can barely see it's like crazy now the problem with Fogo 
with living in Carroll is the closest one is four hours away. They've got one in Minneapolis and one in Kansas City. When you Google the directions, it's about a four to eight minute difference in, in the distance between the two. So we're just going to call it four hours. Four hours away. But here's what you need to know. That hasn't stopped Pastor Ryan from going there. Several times. Yes, it's out of the way. Yes, I have serious trouble driving home after eating there. Probably next time I'm going to get pulled over for erratic driving and not having corrected lenses again. But I have zero problem going out of my way for incredible food. Don't all of you have zero problem going out of the way for certain things in your life? Like, aren't there certain people or certain things that you're fine with going out of the way for? The reason I bring that up is because what I'm about to share with you that Jesus said, it, it's not just what he said, it's legitimately where he said it that has such significance. He went out of the way. And when I say out of the way, I'm not talking about a drive to Kansas City or a drive to Minneapolis. Where Jesus went was a three-day walk. Not a drive, walk. And about 90 to 95% of that was uphill walking. I'm going to let you know, I'm going to tap out. Right there, like I'm not, I'm not going, like I flipped that card to red. If we're going somewhere and we're going to walk for three days and the majority of it is uphill, I'm going to say, hey, Jesus, I love following you. You're the best. You changed my life. I'm going to take today off. I'm going to stay right here, and when you come back down, make sure you bring me like a to-go bag from Fogo. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. So he goes to this place, this place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, again, if you've heard me preach on this ever before, Caesarea Philippi was a horrible place. Um, they celebrated a god um, named Pan, um, and, and Pan um, was this goat god, and people had sex with goats. I mean, it was a bad place. It was, <laughs> it was horrible, just like that joke. It's a place religious. I didn't do that in the last service. Um, it's a place religious people didn't go, and at the time, it was the furthest that any of the disciples had ever been away from home. And when he gets there, he asks them this question. And, and they're nervous, and, and they're scared, and, and they're out of their comfort zone. And Jesus just looks at them and says, hey, guys, um, what are people saying about me? Like, who do people say that I am? Which, which is a question none of us want to ask, right? I mean, it can go crazy. It's a question a lot of us don't even want to know the answer to. And they're nervous, and they're freaking out. They're in a place they shouldn't be. And, and they don't give Jesus a straightforward answer. They don't tell Jesus any of the negative things that people are saying about him. They, they tell him some of the highlights. They're like, well, you know, Jesus, some say John the Baptist, and some say Elijah. Other people are saying some of the other prophets, and, and they're saying good things, but then Jesus puts them on the pot, spot, and he's like, hey, hey I, don't, I don't care about any of that. Like, like let, let me just zero this in even closer. What about you? Who do you say that I am? And all of them were like, oh, man, I don't, I don't know. I have this feeling, and I kind of have this understanding. And then Peter spoke up. And as soon as Peter, Peter started talking, everyone was probably like, oh, man, here we go. Peter, just don't. Just don't. Because Peter, Peter always got it wrong, always. If you, if you read the stories about Peter, Peter was always saying the wrong thing. Peter was always messing up. But in this instance, Peter gets it right. And, and I sort of kind of know how that feels, because every once in a while, you know how it feels to get it right? Married men, nod your head. Don't say it out loud. Just, I'm feeling it right here. I got the amens from your heart. I got it. Peter got it right. Peter looks at him and says, hey, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And all the disciples are like, ah, oh, Peter, like, I don't know, PD, if you should have said that. And Jesus looks at him, and this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. I say to you, now you are Peter, which means rock. And then he says, upon this rock, in other words, upon the statement that you just made, the statement of, hey, Jesus, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're the promised one. You're a fulfillment of prophecy. You are the Messiah. You are God made flesh here on earth. And Jesus said, do that statement right there. I will build my church. Now, the word church right here is a Greek, in the Greek is a word named, called ekklesia. And ecclesia, this, this word we translate church, it literally means a group of called out people. Jesus says, hey, based on the fact that you acknowledge I am the Messiah, the son of the living God, I'm going to build a movement of called out people. And he said, and death and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. I'm going to start a movement 
that's literally going to change the world. And the disciples that were with him, they literally had no idea what he was talking about. They were completely clueless. World? What is the world? I mean, they most likely knew that there was a Rome, Italy, but they didn't know there was a Paris, France. They didn't know there was like London, England. And they didn't know that one day there was going to be a Carroll, Iowa, right? They didn't know any of these places. They just knew Jesus saying, hey, I'm going to start a movement of my called out people, and we're going to change the world. And if you're here today or you're watching online, here's what's crazy. That prophecy right there, you're a part of it coming true. Even if you walked into here today and you didn't want to be here, even if you walked in with both feet on the brakes, you're still like here, and Jesus said, hey, I'm going to start this movement. I'm going to start this thing called the church, and nothing is going to stop it. But here's what's crazy. I see this as prophecy, and I told you that prophecy was given to encourage the believer and warn the unbeliever, and, and that prophecy gets fulfilled, and we've looked at some fulfillments of prophecy in this series. But it's not what he said here. It's not this prophecy of the church starting that's super great and cool and awesome, as, as great and cool and awesome as that is. It's what he said next. And I believe what he said next is the greatest prophecy of all time. I believe there's not a prophecy in Scripture that comes close to this prophecy that he says. What I'm about to share with you, if this doesn't come true, there's no reason for us to be in this room this morning. This is what Jesus said. A few verses after he said, after Peter looked at him and said, hey, you're Messiah, son of the living God. He said, hey, you're right, I am the Messiah. And they're thinking, oh, hey, that's cool, man. He's going to be king, because that's what they thought about Jesus. They thought the promised Messiah was going to come and be an earthly king. And so they thought they're going to go to Jerusalem, and Jesus is going to be like the president, and they're going to be like vice presidents or on the cabinet or something. And so they thought, hey, we're going to be super important because we're tightly connected with you, Jesus, right? Like, it's going to be awesome. And then he tells them this in verse 21. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly, and I love it when he makes it plain. I don't know about you, but Pastor Ryan, he's plain talk. Um, tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem. Well, of course, Jesus. Of course we got to go there. That's where you're going to be king. That's where we're going to be super important. That's where everybody's going to look at you and bow down, and we're going to stand behind you, and so they're going to be down, down to us like it's going to be great. And then he says this, to go to Jerusalem, and he would suffer. Wait, huh? Hold up, what? What's going to happen? Suffer. I'm going to suffer. Listen, for the person in this room or the person watching online that is suffering right now, Jesus gets it. He understands. He suffered. This should be one of those Jesus gets us commercials. He suffered. And so when we lean into him, we're not bothering him. He gets it. We, we have a savior who identifies with us in our deepest, darkest needs because he went through the exact same things. He would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. Don't miss that. The, put this in quotes, the good people killed Jesus. The people who bragged about how righteous they were. The people who talked about how much church they went to, how many Bible studies they did, how many verses they knew. The good people, they're the ones who killed Jesus. The bad people did not kill Jesus. The so-called good people killed him. But he would be killed. But, this is the greatest but in all the Bible. But, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. Now, the men that were with him didn't understand what the heck he was talking about here. They didn't understand Jesus saying, I'm going to get killed. Because, listen, they knew people had predicted their death before. They got that. I mean, all throughout history, people have predicted their own death. If you study military history, you'll see soldiers write into their friends or families or wives or, or whoever, and they'll be like, hey, I'm not going to make it through this battle. This is going to be my final battle. And they died in battle and predicted their death, Right? Lots of people predicted their death, but only one has predicted their death, resurrection, and pulled it off. See, Jesus didn't do what dead people do. Jesus didn't stay dead. Jesus came back to life. Now, understand, if this doesn't happen, if he does not come back from the dead, we're not here. Without the resurrection, we have no Bible because there would be no reason for us to understand or for anybody to even write a story about a man named Jesus. We would have never known what Jesus said. We would have never known what Jesus did. There would be no church. None of this would exist. The resurrection, the resurrection changes everything, and that's the reason we can have hope as followers of Jesus. Jesus said, I'm going to rise from the dead, and he did it. He pulled it off. So with all of that in mind, Two weeks ago, I shared with you seven signs that I said we can look at and, and say these are things that, that are going to happen or these are going to be the signs that show that the end is near. Remember that message? Anybody remember it? Well, Jesus 
is coming back. We've talked about that. We've established that. And he's coming back for his bride. And his bride is the church. And Jesus said this in John chapter 14, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. He says this to, to the disciples and to us because everybody's freaking out. Nobody understands what's going on. He's talking about his death and his resurrection. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Also trust in me. In other words, listen. Like, listen to what I'm saying. Just, just trust. Just believe. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, what I have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Verse 3. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. What's the way he's talking about? Himself. Because he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you want to get into heaven, if you want to get to my Father's house, you get there through me. You know the way. You know it. Now, those were seven signs that I told you, and I told you that, that last week, that there may be like eight or nine, but for that day, I was only going to hold on to seven. Well, I firmly believe that there's eight. And the eighth thing that Jesus said um, for the end times to come is how I wanted to finish this series because Jesus said this has to happen for the end to come. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. And the good news, that's the gospel, the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. You see that? Then the end will come. Jesus said the good news, the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, born a virgin, fully God, fully man, walked and lived a perfect, sinless life here on earth, went to a cross, shed his blood for the remission of our sin, was taken down, put in a tomb, three days later, rose again, walked around for 40 more days, teaching, ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit descended down upon earth. Jesus Christ is alive and still changing lives today. That's the gospel message. In its simplest form, that's the gospel. That will be preached to the entire world. Do you know that we can reach the entire world with one device in our hands right now? It's never been more possible in history, in history, to reach the entire world than it is today. But this is what I believe, and, and I've been reading a lot about this. Many scholars believe that Jesus here and in other places is saying before the end comes, there's going to be a worldwide movement, a worldwide awakening, like millions and millions and millions of people coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior before Jesus returns. Quick question, what organization do you think Jesus is going to use to accomplish that? His what? His church. Now, the experts say, and by the way, can we just pause and acknowledge this? If we've learned anything at all in the past three years, we've learned this. There are no experts, right? Experts just make stuff up. Like you can make stuff up and be an expert these days. Like six feet apart, they admitted it. They had somebody in the room going, Pfft. I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. How about you? I don't know. Six feet. Six feet. Sounds good, doesn't it? Six feet. Say six feet apart. Yeah, that sounds good. Write that down. The CDC experts just made stuff up. Experts. Anyway, I'll get off that tangent. I can tell you're upset about it. Um, the experts, the experts are saying the church's best days are behind us. And the experts are saying that the church in America was on life support and the pandemic just sped it up. But as I look around this room, and I look at our online numbers, and I see last service, I think the experts are wrong. I don't think the experts get to say what happens to the body of Christ. I think the body of Christ gets to determine what happens to the body of Christ. Amen? And I believe that God wants our church, along with lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of other churches, to be a part of a worldwide awakening where we see millions of people come to know Jesus Christ. I say they don't get to define us. I say only Jesus Christ gets to define us. I say Jesus has called us to make a difference in the world because he's coming back for his church. Amen? So with that in mind, I want to invite you into three things that you can do to be a part of the church. Number one, let's get engaged. That's, I'm just kidding. Some of you are like, did he just propose to me? No, I'm not talking about that kind of engaged. I'm talking about let's get connected. Let's get involved. Let's get engaged. Here's the thing. When you think about engagement, if I were to ask every married person here, tell me your engagement story, you would walk me through a process, right? You would tell me, oh, we met. We fell in love. I looked at her, and I said, man, I want to spend the rest of my life with that girl. And then you went. And ask her dad for permission 
to marry his beautiful, brown-eyed baby girl. Just saying. Hypothetically. He bought a ring, tried to propose in a romantic way. She said yes, set a date, went bridezilla, made it to the church on time, all of that. It's a process, right? That's what I'm saying. It's a, it's a process. Everybody knows when you meet somebody special and, and, and you, you want to move forward, there's a, there's a time where you're totally engaged to take those next steps. It's the same way with the church. It's the same way for me with the church. It was a process. Like, I went to church. When I first started going to church, I was like some of you. I went in with both feet on the brakes going, I don't know about this. All I knew about church, seriously, I, I got saved, and then I, and my friends were like, hey, we're going to go to church on Sunday. You come to church with us? I'm like, I don't, I don't know, man. All I knew about church, other than the misery that I endured as a kid going to Catholic church, was the, the Jim and Tammy Faye Baker thing. That's all I know. Some of you remember that. And so I'm like, listen, I'm going to go, but they better not ask me for anything. They better not ask me to do anything. They better not ask me for any money. Like, they better just be happy that I'm going. I went for about a month, and they looked at me one day, and they said, hey, Ryan, you need to get involved. I'm like, I am involved. I show up. You should be happy with that. They said, that's what we're talking about. Next thing I knew, I'm cleaning toilets, and I'm speaking at a youth group. That, that's what involved was for me. Slowly but surely, I got engaged in a local church, and it changed my life. Honestly, it's why I'm here today, 100%. As I look back, <laughs> I can't believe they let me do some of the stuff they did. Get involved. Work with teens. Speak on Wednesday night to the teens. Come and lead a Bible study on Wednesday night for the adults. Speak on Sunday night. Go ahead and preach on Sunday night. Don't preach on Sunday nights ever again. Um, like, I'd never done any of that. It happened slowly, but it was a process. Now, in the scriptures, we are all called to be a part of a local church, a part of the body of Christ. There's an overall body of Christ where churches are all involved. This is not a special church. I don't know if you know that or not, but we would never sell that drug here. We are not the only church. This is not a church where you come in and say, when we say, you got to be part of this church or you're not saved. Like, that's stupid. Run from churches like that. But we're called as a body of Christ to be a part of a local church. And Paul points this out to us. He's writing to this church in Corinth, which is super messed up. We talked about that last week. They are a jacked up church. But this is what he said, and it's fascinating that Paul, talking about being involved in the church, uses this imagery. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. That's true, isn't it? Yes or no? Yeah. Verse, verse 15. If the foot says, hold up, your foot starts talking to you, we got people you need to talk to. Just saying. If the foot says I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, does that make it any less part of the body, yes or no? No. And if the ear says I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less part of a body? Now, I believe when Paul is writing this, he's got a smile on his face because he knows he's just messing with everybody's head right here because they're going, this is ridiculous. Like, Paul, what you been smoking, man? Like, this isn't, like, that doesn't make any sense. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? And then he said this in verse 18. But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. You are called to be part of the body of Christ on a macro level, and we're called to be part on a micro level of a local church. You're a part of the Bible, or a part of the body. Now, let, let, let me kind of explain it like this. Let's say, let's say you lose an ear. Imagine you go home today, and for some reason, some crazy dog named Titus attacks you and tears off your ear. Like it's just down on the ground. Nobody in this room would go, well, you know what? That ain't too bad. I got some teenagers. I've been wondering what they've been talking about. So I'm going to take this here. I'm going to stick it in their car. That way when they're driving around, I'll know what they're saying. First of all, there's an app for that. It's fantastic. See me after service. I'll let you know what it is. Second of all, nobody in here is going, well, that's a great idea. No. If the ear is separated from the body, what happens to the ear at What? It dies because you've, it's got to be connected to the body to function the way that it's been made to function. Yes or no? Let's translate that into the church. There are some people in this room who are watching online. Listen to me. You're not thriving in your walk with Jesus. You know why? You're not connected to a body. And I'm not mad at you. I'm just telling you, you've got to get connected. You've got to be connected to a body. God has given you a special gift and you are way too valuable to sit on the sideline and waste away. God has called his people to be connected to a local church, to use their talent. 
Now, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, because I know the excuse. I know what you're thinking. I know the excuse. I know what you're going to say. I came ready for it. But, Pastor, I'm busy. Just so busy. I understand. I get it. But you know what? This church right here has been built by busy people. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, people that have nothing to do scare me a little bit. (laughs) This church is full of busy people. I understand. Busy, 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 busy people. But listen to me. If you're too busy to participate in what Jesus has clearly called you to do, what Jesus has clearly called us to do and be a part of what he's coming back for, then you're too flipping busy. Listen to me. The way I thought about illustrating this is, is like this. How many of you have ever gotten a gift card? Somebody gave you a gift card for Christmas, birthday, got a gift card. Everyone in here has gotten a gift card, right? Now, I've done this before, and you have too. You get a $50 gift card, let's say to Applebee's. And you go to Applebee's on a date night. You get the Bourbon Street steak, the Oreo shake, whipped cream on the top two. Two straws, one check, girl, I got you. Fancy like, I know. Anyway, go to Applebee's with your gift card, and you put the tip on it. And it's $48.65. Then you take the gift card home and, and, and you put it somewhere and you forget about it until the next time you go to Applebee's, right? Which is five years later because it's Applebee's. And you're like, I had the Bourbon Street steak and the Oreos. And it was so, it's not like what the song said. It was so bad. But I got, you forget about it, right? In fact, how many of you honestly have unused gift cards somewhere in your house? Visa gift cards, Starbucks cards, Jalisco gift cards. I know you always use your Bornero cards. I, I got you. But I read on the Internet, and we know it's true because Abraham Lincoln said everything you read on the Internet is true, that there's about $15.3 billion worth of money on unused gift cards. What could you do with $15.3 billion? Man, I'd like to find out, wouldn't you? Now think about this. If there's that much money being wasted on gift cards, what's being wasted in this room? There are some unused gifts just waiting and wasting away in this room. And you are way too valuable to waste away. So leads to number two. Let's ask people to come sit with us. Let's ask people to come sit with us. Let's not just invite them to church. That's easy. That's easy. Anyone can invite somebody to church. I can invite somebody to church. Hey, you should come to my church. Oh, I, I will. I will. No, let's invite them to come sit with us. This is why. Let me, give you, let me break it down like this. Let's say I tell you all of this great stuff about Fogo. Like it's great. It's awesome. It's the best meat that you'll ever have. It's absolutely incredible. The experience is great. Like it's fantastic, man. You should go. What are you going to say? Oh, maybe sometime. It's four hours away, man, I don't know. Like, Ryan, I believe everything you say about, about it being really good. Like, I trust your judgment on food. I believe it's a life-changing experience for you, Ryan. I, I think it's fantastic and it's great. I, I get there someday, right? But if I said, hey, let's go to Fogo on Tuesday. I'm driving and I'm buying. How many of you are in? Right? There's a difference, Right? There, that's, that's the difference. Oh, you should come to my church. You should check it out. The music is so good. The kids' church is great. They're so friendly. The message is, eh. Um, but the, everything, and, and, and telling that, and somebody saying, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. But hey, man, come sit with me. Come sit with me and check it out. Come. Like, what time does this service start? Is it a 930 service? I, I, I'll pick you up. 910. Be at your house. Come sit with me. Now, here's the thing. Whenever time I say that, every time I talk about us growing, every time I talk about us inviting people, it, it, it brings up some discussion outside of here. And, and I get that. I understand that. Rumors. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever had a rumor said about them? Anyone ever had that? Well, I, just recently, this one came up again about me. And um, it was, it's always funny um, because a lot of them are untrue. Um, but this one, this one I think I'm going to own. This is, this is what I heard the other day. All Ryan wants to do is reach people and grow. <laughs> Guilty. Guilty. I want to reach people for Jesus Christ. I am, 
not ashamed to tell you that because I believe everything is better with Jesus at the center. I believe following Jesus makes you better, and I think it makes you better at life. I think more and more people that meet Jesus and discover hope, peace, and love, and more potential than they did before they met Jesus, I think that's a good thing. I I mean, listen to me. Why is it okay for Walmart to remodel and do all the stuff that they're doing? Why is it all right for Walmart, why is it um, acceptable for them to expand its businesses all over the United States, and we call them successful, but if the church wants to grow, we call them a cult. If there's anything on the planet that should want to grow and reach people for Jesus, it's the church. Listen to me, we have the message of the resurrection, which is a message of hope. We know that Jesus is coming back to take his bride, the church. I will tell you, at the end of the day, the reason I want to grow and reach people for Jesus is because the local church changed my life. Jesus, through the local church, changed my life. And at the end of the day, this isn't my idea for us to reach people. It's not Pastor Ryan's idea to, hey, let's get involved, let's get engaged, let's go out and reach people, let's invite people to come sit with us. It's called the Great Freaking Commission. I threw freaking in there. That's not really there. (laughs) Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, that we're to go into all the world and reach creation. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Luke chapter 24, verse 48, he says, you're witnesses, talking to his disciples, talking to us. You're witnesses to all these things. Go out and tell your story. Go out, talk about life change. Let people know that this is a real deal. John chapter 20, verse 21, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. It's not a suggestion. It's a great commission. And we're called to take the message of hope and joy and peace to a world that's more desperate for joy and hope and peace and love than it has ever been. And and I've said this before, and, and I'll say it again. The lost are not commanded to go to church. Anywhere in the Bible, the church is commanded to go to the lost. Amen? Listen, let me tell you something I've learned. When a person can get into a place and experience the presence of God, the Holy Spirit takes over and does stuff we can't understand. Case in point, I was standing in the foyer one Sunday, and I had preached the message on a guy named Naaman. Remember we did that series? A couple comes up to me, they're weeping. They're like, thank you for the message today. God shows us we need to work on our marriage. I didn't mention marriage anywhere in the entire message. Didn't say a word about it. I didn't say, oh, hold on, y'all. Oh, I'm getting a word. There's a couple here. I think they're over here somewhere. I can feel it. You're struggling, struggling in your marriage, and we just want you to stand up right now so we can let, that would be weird, right? Oh, I don't do that. Anyway, that didn't happen. But when they left, God reminded me, hey, big boy, you think that they're listening to your words, but when it really works is when they're hearing my words. L- listen to me. This is the church you can come to when things are not going well. I say that because so many people say, well, I've got to get my life back together before I go to church. Not this church. You come in here all busted up, broken down, barely making it down the aisle, baby, you'll be on staff next week. <laughs> Number three, let's stop making excuses. Stop making excuses. You ever worn something you probably shouldn't have worn? I'm just talking to men. Just only talk not to women right now. Uh, my son likes to think he's a fashion guru. In his mind, he thinks he is. And about a year and a half ago, it was a Sunday morning, I came walking out of my bedroom, dressed and ready for church. He looked at me and said, uh-uh, that's not what you're wearing to church, is it? You got to stand in front of people, you got to preach. I'm like, no, absolutely not. This is my pregame outfit, boy. I get dressed, and then I go back and put on my real outfit. I'm going to go right now. You want to come with me? I'm going to go in my closet, pick something out. L- listen. Isn't it funny, I don't know if you've ever had this experience or not, but isn't it funny how insecure a teenager can make you feel? (laughs) You laugh because you know that's true. Because listen, some of you are thinking, did he not be there to dress you this morning? Um, No. There are some things that don't look good on certain people. Like, for example, men. I'll just leave it with the men. Some of you, man, you could put on a cowboy hat, look like a cowboy, (laughs) look like a man's man. Just looks natural. Some of us put on a cowboy hat and like, <laughs> like, oh, bless your heart. That's what you say. That's what Christians say when you want to say somebody's a total idiot. Bless your heart. That's what that translates into. Some things don't look good on certain people. And I'm going to tell you this. Self-righteousness looks good on nobody. We've got to be careful because all of us are a little bit self-righteous about certain things. Politics and sports and church people, we've got to be careful 
Because we'll get self-righteous and we'll scream about somebody else's sin. You know why we do it? So we have to deal with our own. It's a distraction from what Jesus wants us to do, and we make excuses. Well, they're worse than I am, and they're doing that, so I'm okay doing that. Stop making excuses. Stop rationalizing away your behavior. You know what you do when you rationalize? You tell yourself rational lies. And the reason I say this is because there are people in this room, some people watching online, listen, you've been hurt by people who wear robes of self-righteousness. I get it. I get it. I saw a book recently. I haven't read this book. I don't know anything about this book, but what it said, the title was so true. Bad Christians happen to good people. Bad Christians happen to good people. I get it, man. If you've been hurt by church people, let me tell you something. I want, I want you to hear me. I want you to listen good. I want you, I'm going to say this as pastorally as I can, as forcefully as I can, as honestly as I can. If you hang out here long enough, you will get hurt. And listen, it's not because we're trying to hurt you. It's because hurt people hurt people. And the only reason we do is because we're humans. We've all been hurt, and we've all hurt other people. But being hurt, being hurt by somebody is not an excuse to take your ball and go home when there are like 4 billion people on the planet that we need to reach with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So I understand you've been hurt by church people. In fact, Jesus talked about that. Jesus in Luke chapter 15 is getting ready to tell like his three most like greatest hits, like his, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. It says this in Luke 15 verse 1, tax collectors and other notorious sinners. I love that because those are my people. <laughs> Not just sinners, but notorious sinners. A notorious sinner is someone that's known for what you did. Anybody in the room can connect with that? Because <laughs> your pastor can. Just saying. Notorious sinners often came to Jesus to listen to him teach. Th those are my people. People that wouldn't go to the temple, but surround themselves with Jesus. Because you've heard me say this before. I've said this a ton. I love this quote. I have no idea who originally said it. It's been attributed to all kinds of people. Nobody I don't think really knows, but it's so true. People that were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus, and Jesus liked the people that were nothing like him. Notorious sinners. Verse 2. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of the law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. I love that. I love that Jesus was not afraid of guilt by association, and neither should his church be, because I hear all the time, all the time, you know who's coming to your church? Pastor, do you see who showed up today? Do you know what they do? Listen, I got my own crap. I want this to be a place where anybody can walk in, but I want you to hear me. You're going to get hurt eventually, not intentionally. Now, that in itself is a whole other message for another time. In fact, we did an entire series on it last year called Hurt People, Hurt People. I'm saying all of that to say this. What's your excuse? What is your excuse? I want you to understand that you have value to the body of Christ, that Jesus has something that he wants to do in you and through you. And listen, if that's not happening to you, then something's not getting done in you because you're not connected. If you're not connected, you're not fully alive. And at the end of the day, listen to me, I'm glad you're here. I love that you're here, but I don't want you to just attend. I want you to be fully alive. Because here's the cool thing about the whole Jesus thing. I'm gonna circle back around to the resurrection. Jesus coming back to life is a big deal, and here's why. If you're a Christian, that means Jesus Christ lives in you. And if Jesus lives in you, then that means that there is nothing you will ever face that will be stronger than you, ever. The Bible says, greater is he who lives in me than he who lives in the world. And Paul said this in Colossians chapter one, verse 27, Christ lives in you, Christ lives in you. And this gives you assurance of sharing his glory. What does Christ in us mean? What does Christ in you mean? Well, as I was working through this message, a lot of times I'll take a lot of the passages and I'll write them down specifically for what they mean to me. And uh, I did that for this sermon. I wrote this down for me, but after I got done, I thought, I want to share it with you because this is not just what Christ is to me. It's what Christ is in each one of us, and this is what Christ is in our church. Let me read this to you. He's called us to be a change agent in this community. He's the breath of life. He's fire by night. He's the one and the only one who makes a way. He's the one who will always stay. He's our healer, he's a provider, he's our peace, he's our strength, he is our hope, he is our power, and he is faithful to meet our needs. His love is unconditional, his grace truly is amazing, his pursuit is relentless, and his plans are immeasurably more. He brings dead things to life. 
He will not let you go. There is nothing or no one he cannot restore. There is nothing or no one he cannot restore. And in him, I can live in him. I am never alone. He is my rock and my redeemer. He is my cornerstone. That's what Jesus is for me. That's what Jesus is for you. Christ in you. And so if you have Jesus living in you, what's your next step? Listen to me. For some, it's get plugged into a local church. And, and hear me on this. Hear me. Hear me. Hear me. Hear me. If this isn't your church, cool. I'm all right with that. There are probably something like 100 churches within a 45-mile driving radius of this church. Find one and plug in. You have no excuse. You are way too valuable to sit and do nothing because Jesus is coming back for his church. You need to be a part of it. And as we reach more and more people and the Great Commission is being fulfilled, the end, well, it's closer every day. Let's pray. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I want to ask for every single one of us in the room to be open, that we be open to what you want to do in our lives. Right now, heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe, maybe you just need to hold your hands out and just say, Jesus, I'm open. Jesus, I'm open to what you want to do. I am open to what you want to do. Maybe you're here today and you never prayed to receive Jesus and you know that's your next step. You know you need to ask Jesus to come into your life. If that's you, if he's not your cornerstone but he needs to be, then right where you sit right now, you can just pray in your heart. You can just pray, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave to pay for my sin. And so right now, I receive you into my life. Come in and take over. Be my Lord, be my God, be my King, and be my Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, we'll have people in the back corners of our sanctuary at our prayer stations that would love to pray with you and for you, talk to you about next steps, get you hooked up with a study Bible. Maybe you're here and there's something going on in your life, struggling through something, you got a sin issue, need somebody to pray with you and for you. Please, please, please understand this is a church where we fully believe that you can't do life alone. You need the help of Jesus and the help of others. And we will walk alongside of you. You will not be judged in this church. So if that's you, use this time as Mike closes us out in song to, to go back there and have somebody pray with you and for you. And so right now, Jesus, we just ask that, that you just move in the hearts of your people through the power of your Holy Spirit. In your name, Jesus, amen. Thanks for joining us for our online service. If you need prayer, please text us at the number at the bottom of the screen. Also, if you're interested in joining us on site, our service times are in Carroll, 8, 9.30, and 11 a.m. on Sundays, and in Creston, 10 a.m. We hope this service has been a blessing to you, and we look forward to connecting to you soon.